Good, good. Kulom Masagilin. Hey, buddy, are you, are you going to do the surgery? I'm, I just finished the talk and then I will, I will find you. Okay. I uh, may do a DLI. Do what? I'd like to do the yesterday after the DLI. Uh, just call me. I'll come oh, and yeah. see you. Yes. Yeah, I'll come and see you. Yeah. All right. Sorry, guys. All right. Uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, I add, I add his. Huh? Ask him which screen they're seeing. The screen you're sharing, the hey, the slide D. Ah, we're not seeing the slide. D. Ah. Mash. Allah la bas ma kunsha bada wa tukum taban. It's always a pleasure to carry conversation with Doctor Medhat. Nama enta Doctor Hisham saab aoui. Yani. <تصفيق> ماشي احاول طبعا احاول ما نتكلمش في الحاجات اللي اتكلمنا فيها قبل كده انما الامعاء دي حاجه مهمه جدا should i speak in arabic or english or both we have some people we have some uh, non arabs uh, in the audience so oh, that's so okay. uh, would be better if we stick to english okay <تصفيق> All right. More than a century ago, the Jesh Billing, that it is a, because uh, I'm talking uh, to the Egyptian team, so uh, my brain usually go to Arabic, but I'll try not to. Uh, the, this is a Jesh Billing more than a century ago. He just concluded that the intestine, small piece of healthy intestine is more important to the human uh, body than any quantity of brains, which is really true uh, based on what we know nowadays. The reason for that, because there is a connection, always a connection between the gut and the brain. Uh, and the gut has a brain of its own uh, that uh, sometimes can control our central brain and vice versa, uh, either through the nervous network or uh, through a neuropeptide secreted by both uh, systems the central brain and the gut. That's why in the old days, on till now, they tell you trust your gut, but you didn't know what to do with any decision in your life, just uh, trust your gut. And that is uh, what's behind it. The intestine um, is a, or the gut in general, not just the intestine from the uh, oropharynx all the way to the anal canal, that has a central rule, rule in the uh, gut humus in the uh, uh, whole energy body equilibrium. So the gut homeostasis, the physiologic part of it, is essential uh, to our well-being. And if you lose the balance, as you can see here, we all would love to be like this. I think uh, Dr. Khafag is exactly, he looks the like same right now. So we are very jealous of him. But if you lose the, uh, the balance uh, uh, one way or the other, you get morbid obesity with all of its problem, or uh, you, uh, they uh, say most of the time you become an Egyptian mummy. Uh, the definition of gut failure really um, uh, evolved over the last three decades. It was, uh, you know, the, nobody even in 1990s knows what the definition of gut failure is. The, the, uh, uh, the European people, particularly the British, had a little bit of interest in defining gut failure, but this is the universal definition now, is a reduction of the functional cell mass and or the absorptive capacity with the need for intravenous nutritional support. So if the patient needs intravenous nutrition to maintain the energy equilibrium, this is defined as gut failure either due to the loss of the mass or the absorptive capacity. The intestine re <coughs> really is, <coughs> excuse me, is a very important organ in its power to adapt. As you can see here, the, uh, to develop gut failure or intestinal failure, in particular, you really have to lose a lot of the small bowel because of the huge surface area, as you can see here, we don't wanna go through the details, but it's a huge surface area from the luminar type of it, the villi, the microvilli, etc. 
um, as we used to teach in the early 90s about how do you measure the hepatic reserve? And we tried to develop a lot of uh, things over the years and still we didn't know how to measure the hepatic reserve. Um, for the intestine, it's a similar uh, situation, but we have uh, the amino acid citrulline, the plasma citrulline, it may reflect the, uh, uh, to some extent, the enterocyte cell mass, but this, but the uh, assay is usually not available for all um, uh, labs uh, uh, across the world. But uh, hopefully one day the uh, citrulline becomes uh, available um, at all uh, uh, laboratories and it can give us an idea of measuring the enterocyte cell mass. And this is the, the levels, as you can see, if you, this is your normal, and this is if you have a transient gut failure after, uh, before the development of gut adaptation. And then when you reach that level, uh, 20 millimole per liter, then you most likely have a gut failure that required uh, intravenous nutrition or nutritional support. This is the path of physiology in general that what they used to teach us in the, in the 80s and 70s and the mechanism of absorption. And that develops uh, with short gut syndrome, with Crohn's disease, with any pathology that affected the gut. Acid hypersecretion, you get a rapid transit time with the short gut if you have impaired residual bowel with Crohn's disease or any other uh, uh, in, uh, intrinsic disorder, uh, short gut when you load the surface area. And then most of this patient also develop bacterial overgrowth due to multiple structures or um, uh, 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 rapid transit time. And then that is make the bile acid waste and cause a lot of issues. The causes of short gut, of, uh, gut failure, I made the slides in 1990s uh, that uh, there is primary five types. Short gut syndrome, what we all familiar with. And when somebody talk about intestinal failure come to your mind only short gut syndrome. But there is a lot of other disorders can give you a gut failure. Neoplastic disorders, and that's something linked to your um, a speciality with different types, uh, gastric poly uh, uh, Gardner syndrome, uh, massive intestinal polyposis, uh, um, dysmoid tumors, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, the, the, the third the evolving one is the global dysmotility, um, what uh, used to call it intestinal pseudo obstruction. Now I call it gut dysmotility. Is not affecting the, uh, it's not just the pseudo obstruction, it's affecting the whole entire organs from the uh, esophagus all the way down to uh, the anal canal. And the enterocyte dysfunction, you see it more in your speciality, Hashem, with the after irradiation of the, of the abdomen due to different uh, reproductive uh, neoplasm or gut neoplasm. And uh, this is the acquired one most of the time. Autoimmune enteritis can cause that. And also in the pediatric uh, uh, group, I'll show you some of the causes. And then portomous enteric vena thrombosis is another uh, added cause of uh, gut failure, uh, not essentially uh, from the nutritional standpoint, um, uh, unless the patient loses the gut because <coughs> of the vascular occlusion. And this is uh, what the American Gastroenterology Association defined the types of short bowel syndrome. You can see on your left-hand side, when you lose to the proximal jejunum, distal ileum was part of the cecum because of the vascular blood supply. Uh, and type three, when you lose most of your small bowel except to the proximal jejunum. Um, and then uh, type four, uh, that when uh, they didn't define at the time, but this is a defined it at the ultra sugar syndrome, because the patient loses everything except to the stomach and the DDN. The causes of the short bowel or sugar syndrome are different in the adults than the children. And the adults, mostly vascular occlusion. Um, I think when um, myself and uh, Dr. Khafagi was 
and the medical school or our early age, uh, we usually use the see the vascular occlusion in those with extensive arteriosclerosis. That's not the case anymore. Uh, we have uh, rare in the children, but in young adults and the adult patient, vascular occlusion is not uncommon even in Egypt now. I get a lot of uh, uh, calls on the uh, on the. Um, uh, WhatsApp with young people lost their gut due to vascular occlusion. And that's most likely due to a hypercoagulable state that we can easily diagnose now, including protein C, S, antithrombin 3, JAK2 mutation, and a lot of other um, uh, causes. Uh, the uh, factor 5 mutation is actually common in, in the Middle East, uh, up to 20% of the population can have factor V mutation, either um, silent or symptomatic, and the occlusion could happen at any age. Uh, Crohn's disease is becoming an endemic in Egypt and Middle East also. Abdominal trauma, uh, radiation enteritis, surgical adhesion. In the, in the kids, they have relatively benign causes, gastroschisis, intestinal atresia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and bulbulus. Uh, the good number of the patient with volvulus have my rotation. That's why I developed the new procedure that published last year uh, to out uh, uh, age uh, the um, uh, LATS procedure. It no longer should be used because it doesn't protect a good number of patients from the development of the intestinal uh, rotation and volvulus with uh, loss of the gut and development of gut failure. Here is a very simple uh, 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 slide uh, to my young colleagues who are interested in short gut syndrome. You will, your patient will require home parenteral nutrition or intravenous nutrition. If they have jejunoileal anastomosis and less of 30 centi 35 centimeter of the intestine, if they have jejunochronic anastomosis, lost to most of the ileum, they require uh, more than six centimeter, not to require TPN, or less than six centimeter if they require TPN. If they have angiogenostomy, they have to have at least 115 centimeter of the small bowel uh, before they require uh, uh, TPN. This is the adaptation process happening to every patient. And that, that I mentioned to you earlier, the intestine is a wonderful organ. We used to believe that the liver is the only organ that can regenerate. The intestine does not regenerate to that uh, with the same uh, biology, but it adapts in a different mechanisms. Um, when you have resection, you start going through the adaptation process. If you don't manipulate it, uh, after uh, to close to two years, you reach the uh, optimal stage or the plateau. And then we can manipulate the adaptation process by all uh, different measures that I will share it with you. So we can enhance the adaptation process and achieve or restore the nutritional autonomy. The adaptation process is uh, very powerful and usually uh, gut hormone um, dependent. And the most powerful uh, nutrient or the most powerful agent to achieve a nutritional autonomy is oral feeding. So enteral feeding, once you start it to enteral feeding patient with sugar gut syndrome, uh, you can see the villi uh, length and the, and the height of the villi goes very uh, uh, significant compare patient to continuing TPN. Just I want you all pay attention to the colon. If you can save any piece of the colon is very, very important because the colon play a major role in salvage of the carbohydrate that is not absorbed by the intestine because of the short gut. The bacteria in the colon is our friend and uh, that uh, transform the carbohydrate to short chain fatty acids and get absorbed as a, uh, as a source of energy. Uh, so the colon play a major role. I have patients lost most of their intestine and they have more than half of their colon and they come off TPN very easily. 
In a paper just we published uh, three years ago in 2019, um, I came with a new definition uh, to that, not new definition, new classification for the types of gut failure. Surgical, as you can see here, hostile abdomen due to bariatric surgery or other causes, and mucosal, that's include the autoimmune disorders and Crohn's disease. And the neuromuscular, which uh, that we used to call in the old days, as intestinal pseudo obstruction, we learn a lot more about it now. And you can see the enteric nervous system is a very complicated enteric uh, network uh, that play major role in regulating the rhythmic function of the gut uh, along with the muscles. So if you have neuromuscular disorders, uh, most likely either congenital or acquired due to systemic diseases can give you gut dysmotility. I'm seeing a lot more than you can imagine uh, of the uh, patient in Egypt uh, with this uh, and neuromuscular syndrome or gut dysmotility. Um, the management of gut failure went through an, uh, an evolution over the last uh, half a century or more. Uh, in 1960, when the, uh, the patient loses their gut function, anatomy or absorptive, they die because there was nothing for them to do. Uh, for them to, there was no therapy for them uh, uh, to receive or the physician have nothing to offer them. In the 1970s um, came the uh, intravenous nutrition, came to play a major role in saving uh, a good number of these patients until they develop complications from the TPN. In the 80s, there was some attempts of medical and surgical uh, treatment trying to uh, reduce the bacterial overgrowth and the intestinal transit time. In the 90s, we introduced the transplantation as an alternative therapy to TPN, or actually a rescue therapy to start with, to save the patients who no longer can be maintained on TPN. Uh, in the, uh, after about uh, 10 years of experience I uh, have with the gut transplantation, the pros and cons, and the learning, uh, learning experience how to do a transplant, it established in my mind how can we uh, establish surgical techniques, innovative techniques that I will share with you. And this is the theme of the talk today to eliminate the need of transplant in some of this patient permanently or temporary. My friend, uh, Dr. Stanley Dedrick, um, uh, he uh, established the, the intravenous nutrition uh, um, uh, tool uh, in the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, he died two three years ago and I had a, a nice uh, dinner with him in uh, Argentina, I think four years ago. And uh, they were, we were introduced, uh, he was introduced at the one who saved the lives of the patient uh, with the uh, intravenous nutrition. And I was the one who eliminated the need for TPN with intestinal transplantation. And you can see this, this is a, a newborn baby or a child uh, that uh, Dr. Dedrick was able to save with intravenous uh, nutrition. And in the 80s, uh, there were a lot of attempts trying to improve the absorptive capacity of the gut. You can see in your left upper hand, the stricture of plastic for patient has strictures or tapering for patient who has part of the adaptation process of the intestine. Intestine gets usually dilated and become stagnant uh, like lakes, and then the bacteria overgrowth eat, uh, uh, eat the food that the patient eats and impair the absorption. And then to slow the transit time, somebody came up with a reversing segment of the bowel uh, to slow the transit time and also develop a valve in the gut. All of these are historic and uh, did not work very well. Then um, 1990, we developed the FK506 or the ProGraph and we showed a, a high therapeutic efficacy with the liver transplant. 
I was, uh, God will, I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, the late Dr. Stalzel assigned me uh, uh, to play a major role uh, in the development of the intestinal transplant. Why the intestinal transplant was not technically feasible at the time, because the highly immunogenic organ, and you can see this uh, lovely uh, slide showing the intestine is like a snake. Uh, that if you don't control the immune activity of the gut, you develop rejection and the rejection takes you to infection because of the, the human is full of bacteria invade the barriers of the mucosa and kill the patient. And, and some patient that the intestine itself reject to the human body and develop graft versus host disease. The prograft help us a big deal uh, to control most of this or to interrupt this, uh, this cycle. Uh, if we have surgeons uh, that are interested in transplant or small bowel or gut transplant in the audience, so this is really showing the uh, vascular anatomy that uh, helped me to uh, uh, advance the techniques of intestinal and multivisceral transplantation, both on the donor side and the recipient side. This isolated intestine in the pocket. This is the multivisceral graft in the, uh, in the cold solution, pancreas, stomach, uh, duodenum, intestine, and the spleen uh, that we usually take it out before we reperfuse the organs. And this is uh, when to uh, extend to that, I was able to use organs from three day old baby and give it to um, a child who is in uh, liver and intestinal failure. The girl now is 25 and doing very well. Just send me her picture uh, as a gift for Christmas. The, when we talk about intestinal multivisera, and this is not the subject of our talk today, you can see the four types of transplant. A yellow color is the uh, transplanted organ, the red color is the native organ, a small intestine liver, intestine, and pancreas in black, and give the pancreas for anatomic and physiologic reasons. And then the full multivisera, stomach, duodena, pancreas, intestine, and liver. And then I modified the technique in patient who has normal liver to modified multivisera because we're having some issues competing uh, for the liver allograft from deceased donor uh, early on and uh, to save another human being if the native liver of the patient who needs a multivisceral transplant is in, uh, has normal function. Um, always I had in mind uh, that um, we have to weigh the balance with, before the com be, uh, between the complication of the intravenous nutrition because transplant is indicated only as of today for only patients who, who require permanent uh, TPN uh, with failure of the TPN therapy due to all this problem. Why I established that and the, was the standard of care still at the in the American government uh, called CMS now because you have to weigh the risk of transplant with the long-term immunosuppression versus the uh, potential risk of the TPN. This is, you can see in your left, left hand side, the abdominal cavity is totally empty with all the abdominal organs except to the kidneys. And here you can uh, see the, um, you can see the abdominal organs uh, uh, back to life after reperfusion, which is a very um, uh, rewarding feeling. Why does it want to go? You guys are frozen, I don't know why. Okay, uh, now during this period, and I put this because uh, of your interest in, 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 in uh, surgical oncology and um, gut uh, oncology, that some of the patients I was able to give them a pull through operation uh, if they have rectal cancer or so, and a few years later, uh, that required a transplant to uh, give them a pull through operation. This is the four members of the same family, an uncle and, uh, and a nephew and nephew and niece. All of them have Gardner syndrome. I was able to uh, save their life, got well 
with the modified or full multivisceral transplant, all of them are currently alive up to about 29 years now, he is. And uh, Greg also, uh, he is uh, completely off immunosuppression doing well. And then put the slide because make you uh, have some interest in uh, diseases that you deal with uh, most of the time, Gardner syndrome. Uh, in the year 2000, or uh, 2002, uh, published this paper to announce that the intestine came to stay and it's a standard of care for patient uh, who lo no longer can be uh, maintained on TPN and those with complex abdominal pathology. Uh, this is my late mother. Uh, she was celebrating uh, my single-handed approval of the American government to consider a small bowel transplant and multivisor at the standard of care for patients who have complex abdominal pathology and no longer can be maintained on TPN. And the, as you can see here uh, in the party, they put a, a TPN bag and my and my plate uh, uh, just making fun of me. The experience with the first 500 patients uh, published in 2009, declaring that the standard, the intestine had a long-term, had a five, at least five year survival similar to any other organs. In 2012, I showed that the long-term outcome for those who survived more than five years had an excellent uh, survival, excellent quality of life comparable to the uh, patient uh, who had a liver uh, transplant. And uh, in addition to that, uh, they are completely off TPN with an excellent quality of life compared to those who continue to survive on TPN. And this is an example of um, uh, a French girl, uh, Gina. She was transplanted when she was six months old in 1989. She is currently alive and doing very well. Just to switch it here from cyclosporin to program uh, in uh, 1993. And this is Tracy. She's one of my patients I transplanted in Pittsburgh. She's an adult, married, and have kids now. Also, some of these patients that were able to, uh, you know, reproduce and have kids um, uh, married and have kids and have functioning family. Despite all of this, intestine, intestinal multivisceral transplant is different than some of the organs, and there is some limitation uh, that uh, make me believe that. Before you consider a small bone and multivisceral transplant, you should really try everything possible to rehabilitate the gut and get rid of TPN and restore the nutritional autonomy. Rejection, intestine has a higher risk of rejection than the liver or any other organs. The second in line to the intestine is the lung. The chronic rejection is a sinister problem in these patients with the intestine, particularly those who have liver-free allograft isolated intestine, because we know, as we uh, published um, uh, in uh, on a few papers, that the liver had an immunoprotective effect on the intestine, not just on the intestine and any other organs. Um, the graft versus host disease, although the risk is about five to 7% higher in the children, and those with multiviscera, is uh, when I see this uh, patient with this skin rash, my, uh, my, uh, my heart sink in because it's very difficult to save them when they reach that stage. The only thing I would vote for intestinal transplant and multivisera to all patients who have gut problems with or without failure, if we achieve um, tolerance, patient can be transplanted uh, without need for immunosuppression. That's why we're moving to uh, uh, our uh, main uh, subject is how can we rehabilitate the gut without transplant? We have three uh, tools. One is the biologic agent, growth hormone, uh, and or GLP-2, 
and then bow lengthening uh, different than the historic one that they used in the 80s and the autologous uh, reconstruction, uh, which uh, actually is something uh, that uh, uh, has introduced innovative uh, gut surgery uh, to the um, surgical arena. You only can do that if you establish a multidisciplinary team approach as they did in Pittsburgh and in, in Cleveland. Here, the medical treatment with the biologic agent, the growth hormone, I was, uh, I played a major role in 2013 to convince uh, the uh, 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 American government uh, to approve for the first time in history, the growth hormone for patients with short gut syndrome. Um, and then in 2012, we were able to uh, get the, the uh, tetiglutide, which we call it GLP-2. It's, uh, uh, as you know, the gut hormone uh, that uh, uh, really played a major role in, uh, in gut rehabilitation in some of these patients. Although it's a very expensive drug, uh, it cost at least $200,000 a year which something really one use in Egypt, uh, but uh, the cost is uh, very prohibitive. Although I have some of my colleagues in Europe working on another analog of GLB-1, GLB-2 will be a lot cheaper. It will help us to uh, help a good number of patients in Egypt. Doesn't wanna move. Please move. Please move, please move. Okay, and the, I, all what I discussed with you now, I'm gonna summarize the outcome so you don't think I'm crazy or I'm making things up. Uh, this is a documentation in the Annals of Surgery and I presented at the American Surgical Association, if you guys are familiar with, they said the highest all this prestigious surgical society worldwide. And I focused on surgical innovation with the development of a novel predictive model that will help physician and surgeon to decide when patient can go for gut rehabilitation rather than for a transplant. The patient population, uh, about 500 patients, actually uh, some of uh, them from across the globe, 10%, you can see I did a good number of them, not a good number, out of the 10%, about seven or eight patients in Egypt. And all these patients came. This is the only Egyptian patient I did in Egypt. The rest of the patient came to the United States uh, to, uh, uh, to the Cleveland Clinic. And even from all the country, the United States, all the states here, you can see, 46% uh, uh, they're local uh, in the uh, tri-state area close to Ohio, 44% from even the, the uh, west coast of the country. Um, and you can see here 40% of this patient had a catastrophic gut failure due to different reasons, and 60% has chronic gut failure uh, with chronic gut disorders uh, that uh, that lingered with them for years and years. The catastrophic gut failure patient, most of these patients, good number are surgical or not surgical, and they were transferred to me to Cleveland uh, after six to eight months to a year uh, sitting in the hospital. As I showed you earlier, I used this material to define uh, the three major types of gut failure, surgical, as you can see, and mucosal and neuromuscular. Why I'm saying that, this is the percentage, or I'm showing this slide again, show you that 60% of the gut failure in this patient population, about 60% 60, 60 are due to surgical causes of gut failure, mishap surgery uh, for different reasons. And then you can see the mucosal disease, Crohn's, et cetera, is 19%. Neuromuscular, is second to surg surgical causes of gut failure is 21%. Uh, I'm sure this, uh, this percent will change based on the, in Egypt, for example, the things may be different a little bit, but I would expect that they're gonna be the same. The surgical gut failure, you can see here, 24% of these patients have 
uh, complicated bariatric surgery. You can see the others, but I'm trying to emphasize malignancy 8%. Uh, congenital anomalies, 9%. Ent enteric fistulas uh, due to mishap surgical cause or Crohn's disease, 31%. And this is the main cause of causes um, with itself without fistula, Crohn's disease, uh, enterorensic vasculopathy, radiation enteritis, etc. And um, I summarized the causes and types of gut failure after bariatric surgery and also presented at the American Surgical Association in 2015. It took me about 10 years to convert to the ASA, American Surgical Association, to accept uh, my work in the field. And these are most of the bariatrics, eminent bariatric surgeon that they developed the field. And I shared my experience with them to make them aware of the problem that they don't see because they do the bariatric surgery and patient goes away. One important thing in the paper, I told them they have to close the Peterson defect, must close any mesenteric defect because the leading cause of gut failure in these patients is the development of valvulus. This is when 2015, I was pleased to hear in the, um, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a meeting uh, through Zoom four days ago, uh, uh, an expert, and uh, it become the standard of care, my recommendation, what I told them, they have to close the mesenteric defect. And the all data showed a significant improvement in outcome with the uh, uh, significant reduction in the incidence of uh, valvulus and the internal herniation in these patients. The treatment for the 500 patient, you can say mostly was uh, autologous reconstruction, remodeling. Uh, TPN, I mean, uh, transplant was required in only 10, 16% of these patients and 7% uh, to 8% of the patients uh, either were not candidate for surgical intervention or transplant. The surgical uh, treatment, the non-transplant surgical treatment was uh, called it autologous uh, gut reconstruction and surgical remodeling. I'll show you the pictures. And they developed, we developed the management strategy for this patient. And the management strategy depends on three major variables. One, the anatomy of the residual gut, what the anatomy look like. Two, the cause of gut failure. Why did they lost the gut? Um, uh, is it absorptive? Is it surgical? And then what is the current status at the time when on, at referral? What the current status of the liver? Is the liver function still preserved or they develop or they are in a process of developing liver failure? And you can see here the three uh, uh, central uh, management uh, tools, autologous reconstruction for those who have got re uh, reconstructable gut, have enough gut to reconstruct, and they have preserved liver functions. Surgical remodeling, mostly for patients with this mortality, and they don't have short gut syndrome, or those who have a short gut syndrome that we can deal with. And transplantation, uh, will take the failure of all of the above or patient have ultra short, ultra short gut syndrome that you cannot reconstruct or remodel. As you can see here, if you fail autologous reconstruction or surgical remodeling, then you go for a transplant. Even with that, because of the uh, uh, financial feasibility of giving GLB2, I throw GLP2 or GATX, we call it here, uh, on this patient uh, to improve the uh, nutritional autonomy before I consider them for transplant. Because that they tell most of the patient, nothing better than your own gut. If I can save your gut and save you a transplant, that will be my dream for all patients. Because that, but it doesn't happen to all of them. For my surgical colleagues who are listening uh, to us, uh, that the rationale for autologous gut reconstruction, which is a lot of patients that you can save and help. And actually, I'm in the process of establishing a fellowship program 
at a nurse hospital so some of uh, the uh, young generation can come and learn how to uh, do this autologous reconstructions. Uh, whatever the cause of gut failure is, that a good number of these patients are good candidates for autologous reconstruction. Uh, the first principle is spare any native organ you have. Uh, don't get rid of it, spare it, and I'll show you how. And restore the elementary flow. Try to restore the gut uh, anatomy the way God creates us. And you have three principles, uh, three or three component or compartment of the gut: the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. You can see this is spare native organ patients who have uh, prior gastric surgery for uh, bariatric or other reasons. You can do gastroplasty for them, uh, uh, reconstruction, reanastomosis, uh, plasty, whatever you uh, can do for them. And then spare also native organs, particularly patients who have a gastric bypass or whatever cause that uh, uh, make them lose part of the foregut. You can see this, I can gastroesophageal anastomy. You can see this patient bariatric surgery patient who had row and Y and then had a sleeve and back and forth and have some residual stomach that I could reconstruct them with myeloroplasty. Uh, patient also have the adenal fistulas. I reconstructed the adenum and, uh, and spared as much of the intestine as the adenum or small bowel. Uh, patient who have problems after Whipple, you can see here, um, it just, um, whatever you can do um, uh, with innovations to restore the gut function and gut anatomy. Some patient also would ID a good number of patients now in Egypt, actually from Egypt and from, um, I have two kids I did from Libya and Iraq that uh, colon interposition uh, or colon bypass uh, for some of the patient postochorosis, et cetera. And those who lost to the stomach um, uh, due to bariatric surgery or gastric cancer or whatever, uh, create a new stomach for them. Uh, the, just a young guy, 26 year old, I did him, I think uh, when I was in Egypt last time, uh, with big uh, gastric cancer. And lucky enough, uh, he has free margins, negative lymph nodes, uh, and I created the a new, new NEO stomach for him. And you can see here, even I use the colon is my friend. The patient have big, huge adenal defect due to surgical reason or Crohn's disease or tumor or whatever. I use the colon um, uh, to patch the adenum to restore the um, alimentary flow. I didn't go easy and do row and why all this uh, old fashioned things, try to restore the alimentary flow the way God creates us because it plays a major role on the gut hormone homeostasis, major role. Um, uh, some patient also, I use the colon as an interposition graft uh, 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 to restore the foregut anatomy. And even those who lost their entire gut and uh, they have biliary fistula, pancreatic fistula, esophageal fistula, I use the colon to restore all these, um, uh, uh, to drain all these uh, anatomic structures and uh, clear the infection in the abdomen until I transplant them. And I will show you an example of that. And this is the mid gut and hind gut, no brainer. Uh, every, even if I have 10 enteric anastomosis, I do it. Uh, every centimeter or inch of the bowel mm, count. So uh, preserve almost every single centimeter. Sometimes it takes me 12 hours in the operating room to do that, but it, it brings patients back to a normal life uh, with no uh, nutritional support and no need for transplant and long-term immunosuppression. Another example of patient that I use the colon to restore the gut and even those who have colonic fistulas, you can see Sailor and Taylor everywhere um, uh, the patient needs.
Then the remodeling procedure is the serial transverse enteroplasty. A, um, a, uh, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, who is a medical student at Harvard of, uh, of Asian descent, uh, came with the idea to uh, make the intestine like a cordion and do serial transverse enteroplasty based on um, surgical anatomy unique for the intestine um, that we don't have time to discuss it now. As you can see this after you lengthen the bowel and the whole idea is to reduce the transit time, prolong the transit time so the enterocytes can absorb the food and reduce the risk of bacterial overgrowth because the intestine is not as usually dilated and no stagnation. At, uh, in the paper I published in 2019, I introduced the same technique to the colon and it's working very well. I call it serial transverse coloplasty. And I did the first case in humans. Uh, four years ago. For the, uh, for the surgical remodeling for patients who have their entire gut, but the gut is not working, um, I let you know that the gut dismotility affected the three, uh, the three component or the three compartment of the gut, foregut, midgut, hindgut. The hindgut is the first organ to be affected and feed and uh, back uh, up all the food to the intestine and the stomach give them a lot of problem. And the very simple, you do subtotal or nil total colectomy, ileorectal anastomosis. Some of the patients have usually dilated intestine. You do a chimney ileostomy temporary, and then you close it later on. Matter of fact, I did a girl nine years old from Saudi Arabia. And I was so pleased to show it back home and doing good off TPN, eating and drinking. Uh, the problem I face in the Middle East is stomach is something very bad for them. They hate it. And uh, I think it's a culture or whatever. And she said, can you close my stomach? I said, you need to wait a little bit longer because we, uh, we're trying to go around the disease because there is no treatment for the disorder now, uh, except I believe in maybe a decade or two, there will be some genetic manipulation uh, to those who have got this motility to your hereditary or uh, genetic mutations. And this is the serial transverse enteroplasty as part of the modeling. Sometimes um, when, um, and I advise the bariatric surgeons or any surgeon, not don't do side to side anastomosis by all means, unless you have to, because when you do side to side anastomosis, uh, this anastomosis has a significant high risk of dysmotility and the intestine becomes usually dilated. And I'm sure some of you will remember if you reoperate in your patient years later who have side to side anastomosis, they develop that. The only way to lengthen the bowel in these patients is to take this, to do transverse cut and connect to this dot, to this dot, and you lengthen about 15, 20 centimeter. I uh, just did this uh, 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 technique in a patient from Puerto Rico uh, five days ago. And the other thing also, patients who have portomesenteric venous thrombosis, where they see a lot of young kids in Egypt now, really a lot more than I thought I would see that have portomesenteric venous thrombosis with uh, life-threatening variceal bleeding, then I do a, what I call it, funky shunt or a typical shunt with interposition uh, being graft or Gore-Tex graft to decompress the system. You only, you only do this in patients who still have reserved liver functions and um, no advanced cirrhosis. This is an example as I uh, showed you earlier, a patient have bariatric surgery, went sour from Qatar and came to uh, uh, Columbia University in New York and they made it worse for him because uh, in hindsight, I think he had abnormal vascular anatomy that, uh, that the surgeons were not aware of. So he came to me with the salivary fistula, esophageal fistula, pancreatic, pancreatic, fistula, and biliary fistula. So he came 
and they connected all this together and then transplanted him with a modified multivisor because his liver was good. He actually wrote a book, a wonderful book, uh, and he titled it, My Journey from Death to Life in Arabic. Uh, he's a writer from Qatar. It's a beautiful book showing you how uh, both patients and physicians should never give up. And you can see here, I reserve a part of his native colon and then a conduit between uh, closed this salivary fistula, used the part of his colon on colon that I, transplant, I connected before the conduit between the transplanted stomach and the esophagus and give him the modified multivisor transplant stomach, duodenum, uh, pancreas, and uh, the intestine. And he's six years out now doing very well. And you can see this uh, uh, in motion here, uh, the procedure in motion. That's him uh, when he came to me from, um, from Columbia University. And this is abdomen, how it looks. And this is the surgery I did for him. And this is when the organs are in. I would come quickly because I were running out of time with this integrative, I call it integrative management approach with the total 500 patients that you have a five-year survivor, 68% of patients, almost all of them were about to die. And I used also the 38 patients that were not a candidate for surgery, transplant or autologous reconstruction, uh, showing their five-year survival. Still, they can live on TPN, but the outcome is not as good as the surgical intervention used the, uh, the data to establish a, uh, a uh, survivor risk factors. Uh, continuation, if TPN had the highest hazard ratio, uh, comorbidity before surgery, and then uh, patients, a good number of the patients has prior thoracoabdominal transplant, heart transplant, lung transplant, kidney transplant, um, and liver transplant um, alone. So this is another risk factor history of abdominal malignancy, uh, to my surprise, was not as high as the other three. And thrombophilia, uh, those who have portomous enteric renal thrombosis or lost to got to do, uh, to you do extensive uh, vascular arterial or venous thrombosis. Age uh, is another uh, risk factor. To restore the nutritional autonomy mean the patient comes off TPN without transplant, just with the autologous reconstruction. Uh, you can see it here, 71% in the middle uh, pie. And no, those who did not undergo transplant or surgical intervention, still a three to four, three patients out of the 12, of the th out of the 38, were able to achieve nutritional autonomy with GATX. Surgical transplant achieved, of course, the best outcome as regard restoring the nutritional autonomy, but on the expense of immunosuppression and having an umbilical cord uh, between the patient and the physician and the uh, potential risk of rejection, as I told you before, acute chronic and graft versus. This is the, you can see the accumulative um, uh, uh, achievement of discontinuation of TPN at five years, about 78%. Those who have surgical intervention versus those who have totally has uh, continued to be on TPN, you can see a highly significant difference. And if you compare transplant to odologous reconstruction, as I said earlier, transplant achieved a better uh, cumulative instance of autologous uh, nutritional autonomy compared to the surgical. But over time, the autologous reconstruction reached a similar um, uh, incidence or achievement of RNA, the restored nutritional autonomy. If you look at the cause of gut failure, surgical patients do the best followed by the mucosal, pay, mucosal disease patient, the green curve, and then the neuromuscular patients because of their intrinsic disease is still there. We're trying to get a lot away for uh, trying to go around it because we cannot change the neuromuscular disorder they have. 
you can see here those uh, nutritional auto the those who achieved the nutritional autonomy transplant versus autologous gut reconstruction, and you can see uh, the indices of the nutri achieved nutritional autonomy autonomy are similar. In other words, the BMI, the prealbumin, the albumin, the vitamins are very similar for those who were transplanted and achieved nutritional autonomy and those that we saved them a transplant and we give them, we restored to their gut function. So the, the outcome with all nutritional indices is the same. Use the data to establish a predictive model of the restored nutritional autonomy and use all these variables uh, to establish the model. And they call it Kareem's model. And we used uh, this uh, ROC curve of some of you are uh, uh, familiar with uh, to establish the model. And this is the model. It's in the Apple store and uh, anybody can use it. Uh, see how, mu how, mu how much small bowel your patient have. Do they have the ileocecal valve or not? Do they have ultra sure gut? What the cause of gut failure? How much a TBN they need? Uh, how much volume, etc. And then we'll give you the probability if you do autologous reconstruction, uh, you can just go through this, you will give you everything you put it and we give you the answer and the percentage of achieving nutritional autonomy uh, within the six months after, uh, after surgery. Uh, my uh, dream is uh, if uh, plasma citrulline levels could be utilized routinely, you can see a linear correlation between the bowel length and the citrulline level with some outliers, and that is will actually enhance the, uh, the, uh, the RNA model. Quality of life, you can, you can imagine if you restore the gut function of your patient uh, with no need for TPN versus doing a transplant. You can see here, this is the transplant oral medication up to 15 medications um, uh, a day versus the autologous reconstruction close to nil. And the same thing as you can see here with the hypertension, diabetes, renal insufficiency, renal failure, all these are cumulative complications of, uh, T of immunosuppression. And that is with differentiate between um, uh, the high bars of these complications with transplant compared to the very stunted bars um, with autologous reconstruction. And this is the karnofsky lanisky score, if you're familiar with, assists the, uh, uh, the daily function and productivity. You can see even as you are, um, has similar or, or bet better outcome or score than transplant. Cost also play a major role. And that is very important also for the developing countries and for Egypt or all any country now because of the financial reconstraint. Constraint. This is the total cost of autologous reconstructive surgery, $69,000 in Egypt divided by 100 or 200. So it will be a lot less. And uh, the liver-free transplant, 170,000 and uh, for the liver contained allograft goes to close to a half a million. Uh, TPN cost per year 250,000. I'm sure it's a cheaper um, in, 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 in Egypt to some extent, but we are having a major problem that we don't have the system for home parental nutrition in Egypt. And that's my target for the next year or two to make it a standard of care uh, for uh, patients with gut failure in Egypt. Uh, you can imagine how many patients died because of lack access to uh, TPN. And I talked to uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Afar, the Minister of Health, that there should be a national um, uh, program for home parental nutrition and intravenous nutrition for these patients. Uh, you can see here the uh, tetiglutide or GLB2 goes up to 300,000. Hopefully we'll have a cheaper analog in the very near future. This is an example of a girl. Um, uh, ironically, 
Uh, that's her picture when I did her in Pittsburgh uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, she had the shortcut syndrome uh, due to very mysterious uh, congenital disease that the intestine was, I uh, call it uh, the thymine intestine, that the intestine share the uh, wall together, the loops. Ironically, she married to an Egyptian guy now, and she lives in New Jersey. And she came to me to lengthen her bowel because she started having some bacterial overgrowth and because of her short gut syndrome and uh, some malabsorption. Uh, again, my uh, home take message to you, um, uh, if we cannot fix the engine, then transplantation is the way to go. Uh, but it is worth it. If, you have a, if we can establish uh, good mechanics, I think everything will go well. And I think uh, we're done now, uh, Dr. Hisham. Okay, thank you, Dr. Karim, for this uh, illustrative talk. We uh, Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Dr. Madhat Kafega. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I didn't see any hands. How many hands do you have? <laughs> I'm very proud this, this of this uh, novel, innovative work, really. Okay. I'm wondering if uh, nobody has nominated you for the Nobel Prize for Medicine? Well, it's, it's Egyptian. It's an Egyptian. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Well, but yeah, I know that Nobel Prize in medicine usually in academic uh, no, in uh, innovative things, but uh, it has to be, uh, you have to be nominated, you know. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. I think uh, all, like you, all my life I work for the patient. I don't care about government. I don't play politics. Uh, I don't kiss asses, excuse my word. Uh, all I do is to serve the patient the best I can. And that's all in God's hands. But uh, I really never, uh, never been interested in any rewards except from God. That truly, I'm not, okay, thank that's you. who I am. Okay, we have I'm a wondering from... if Cairo University can nominate you. But I think oh. uh, nomination uh, through United States is better. Uh, so just all okay. my, all my uh, hope and my dream at the Tormid Hat in we establish a new generation in Egypt can um, deliver, um, can learn these techniques and deliver um, uh, this type of work uh, uh, to the patient to benefit them. That is, should be our goal. And that's my goal for the next year or two. Because if we die, if I die without teaching young generation, then I did not achieve anything. Okay, let's start taking questions. Dr. Mustafa oh. Shazli. Shazak <laughs> There is, uh, I tried everything. Um, I think the modality is the patient symptoms. Um, uh, the, the answer to that on Apple Watch. The, uh, a few things, um, it, the, 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 the diagnosis of gut dysmotility is by exclusion, and that is the problem. There is no, we used to do intro GD manometric studies. We used to do anal manometric, we still do it. Uh, we use the SITS markers, which is the, uh, came to play for the last 10 years. But even these patients with the SITS marker, the SITS marker goes around the bulky stool in the colon and they pass it and there is still, their colon is full or loaded of fecal material, bacterial overgrowth, etc. 
Um, and some of these patients, as you may know, that sometimes they perforate their colon as the, the patient you take care of it. But the way she's doing really well, she's dancing everywhere and she finished the college. I didn't know if you still in touch with her or not. Um, and uh, it's an it's unfortunate situation because we don't have this, the syndrome of the gut dysmotility or chronic, and chronic inertia, that is an old term. Chronic inertia is the early symptom of the gut dysmotility, is our congenital or acquired in the congenital, there are different categories, the acquired are different categories. So a whole spectrum to the extent I wrote the chapter uh, to uh, one of my young uh, colleagues here, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. It hasn't been published yet, but it really uh, emphasizes how uh, serious gut dysmotility is, and there is no uh, definitive uh, uh, objective diagnostic criteria for them. Uh, you do the capsule, you do the SITS marker, you do you have to rely on the patient's symptoms and uh, the progression of their disease. Uh, some of them you may see esophageal dysmotility. Some of them, if you have facility to do the intradidinal manometric, if you do nuclear medicine, but nothing, nothing more important than the chronicity of the symptoms of the patient and take a full history from them, spend time with them in the clinic, find out exactly uh, what would be the diagnosis. There is other associations like scleroderma patients, uh, patients with any autoimmune disease, lupus, all these disorders are commonly associated with gut dysmotility. And it's a progressive disease, you know, stuff. It's not just a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, static disease. It's a progressive disease. Even those who have chronic inertia, you go years later, they start having a small bowel issue. The first, the hind gut is the first to be affected. The foregut is the second to be as, uh, affected. And the mid gut is the third com compartment to be affected. Uh, in the 90s, I used, mm -hmm. until I developed the trifecta procedure, I used to transplant all of these patients as long as they're requiring TPN. But I uh, wrote a paper in 2021 uh, 20, about the outcome after intestinal multivisceral transplant. And you can see about 5% of them, they have recurrent disease of the transplanted organs. So it's, we're learning every day, but there's really nothing more important than your clinical experience and listening to the patient carefully and you will find it very easy to make a diagnosis. Hmm? Another okay, question. Okay, another question. Uh, regarding the superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Uh, it's, a fe it's, a fe it's a figment of imagination. I told, the, I told uh, the American it's a figment of imagination means that it's a radiologic hallucination. لأن ساعات حضرتك بعض الناس يعني أعتقد بتبقى motility disorders أكتر ما هي anatomical problem والعيانين دول بيستريحوش بعد ما الواحد بيعمل لهم حتى حاجة I, I agree with you 100% even when I go and operate on them I reverse whatever done for them before and I educate all the gastroenterologists and radiologists here it's a figment of imagination it, it's just a radiologic finding does not mean anything. طب حضرتك الناس دول يعني انا انا يعني بحب اعمل لهم زي موتيليتي ستادي ما اعرفش راي حضرتك ايه لان ساعات بحس ان الامتنج هو اللي مشكله بتاعه الاستومك اكتر منه السوبر ميزنتريك وخصوصا انه ساعات يقول الانجل ما يكونش فيه دايليتد ديودينم سكند بارت او ثيرد بارت it's a, it's a, you would get its clinical experience and uh, full details in the history of the patient and their symptomatology is very, very, very important. That's why I developed this uh, scoring system for the malrotation patients because um, about 38 to 40 percent of them, Mustafa, have uh, global dysmotility. Why? 
because the malnutrition patients have three major components. One, lack of the lack of the normal rotation. Why? Because of two important things. One, the uh, the uh, maldevelopment of the neuroenteric um, system of the gut. Two, the lack of development of the mesentery. So it's a mesenteric and neuroenteric uh, uh, disease rather than anatomic malrotation. The malrotation developed because an embryo, there was a lack of the development of a proper neuroenteric system that allowed the intestine to rotate. And with, accordingly, the mesentery is maldeveloped because you have trying to teach even the pediatrician here and surgeon, they attacked me in one paper and I put them into their place and I slammed them in a, in a review article um, I, <coughs> a year ago. I'd be more than happy to send it to you that they don't understand. Yes. They're living in the past. The malrotation is, when I'm telling you why I'm telling you that, because that's what it is, is, um, is the neuroenteric system play a major role in the symptomatology of this patient? Uh, that's why you said, if even you operate on them, try to bypass the duodenum, you're still having the same symptoms. As I said earlier, if you remember that their mid gut and foregut symptoms are related to the hind gut because of the feedback mechanisms. Um, and uh, it's an it's a as they put it in the 2021 uh, paper that is the most disabling disease any human being could have uh, with the gastrointestinal uh, functions. And um, uh, you're treating the symptoms. You, you, you cannot treat the disease uh, at the present time. So the best you can offer them, uh, some of them I do pylora trifecta, trifecta, trifecta. Uh, you do uh, uh, subtotal colectomy or nortotal colectomy. You do pyloroplasty and uh, some of the patients, they require temporary chimney ileostomy. If you read the 2019 paper, it will give you some ideas what to do. But uh, severe mesenteric artery syndrome that uh, in my mind does not exist and will never exist. Thank you, Abby. Shukran. Okay, uh, Dr. Ajazwani. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you? Yes, yeah, thanks, Prof. Karim, for your uh, inspiring work and uh, beyond words, what you are doing. Uh, just wanted to have your feedback. We, as kind of uh, surgeons, like who deal with uh, like emergency cases on a regular basis, uh, what should be the approach once like we encounter a patient with who has landed up with mesenteric venous thrombosis with huge infarcts of the gut? apart from any double laparotomies and all that, what should be our approach? How can we ensure that the patient gets the maximum uh, length of the intestine? That's that's excellent, excellent question. Uh, uh, thank you, Ada. Uh, one thing is you have uh, to find out, if you can, if this is arterial or vascular occlusion or both. If it's venous occlusion, you have a good a chance to save as much intestine as you can, even if it looks dusky to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you feel arterial pulse and, and the patient intestine is still ischemic and congested, uh, go for a second look. If it's arterial occlusion, uh, then as you know, they said in the textbook, uh, try to be conservative, look for a second or even third look, uh, remove the obvious dead bowel. If you have segment of bowel questionable, uh, uh, then go for a second look. Uh, do not ever connect to the intestine 
and the same uh, in the first phase of the exploration or the first operation, and you will be surprised. Um, that's exactly one of the bariatric surgeons uh, asked me that question uh, a week ago that uh, the intestine was very ischemic and uh, went a second look and the intestine nearly totally recovered. I told him that is a venous infarction. Oh, the venous ischemia, because you see even the intestine more bluer when you have venous outflow obstruction and the intestine uni unique and develop a lot of collaterals very quickly. And if the patient is hemodynamically stable, everything is good, um, Asia, wait not just 24 hours, 48 hours, as long as they're stable enough, wait, the longer you wait, the more chance you will save more bowel in these patients until they develop either venous or arterial collaterals. So if you go in, try to be very conservative, uh, find your pathology, is it arterial or venous, you anticoagulate them and go for a second look, not necessarily within 24 hours or 48, you can make it even up to 72 hours as long as the patient hemodynamically stable and uh, no evidence of sepsis uh, or any other uh, concerning uh, um, symptoms or signs uh, push you to do for go for a second look. Uh, and most of these patients, based on your skills and experience, try to avoid a recon uh, reconnecting them at that stage. Get a chimney. And I tell my young guys here, patients life first patient's life first. Um, uh, and uh, second, preserve as much intestine as you can. Third, don't rush to do primary reconstruction. And those with bariatric surgery, this is another interesting thing that try not to reconstruct the foregut, particularly with, with uh, gastric bypass. Remove all, obviously, and definitely dead pieces of bowel, get diverting stomas or whatever you want to do, and then don't work in reconstructing the stomach or the foregut in an anatomical fashion until they fully recover from all of this. It takes weeks, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it takes. But keep in mind, life, patient's life first, second, preserve as much intestine as you can, work uh, religiously and, um, and with the patients, even if they need three or four uh, exploration to preserve as much intestine as you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gamal Amero. Dr. Karim. ازيك حبيبي ايه الحلاوه دي انت بتخلينا عايز اروح انام الوقت على طول اهو وحشني يا باشا ازيك يا دكتور جمال اتس ا وندرفول ليكشر الحقيقه فيري كومبريهنسيف وفيري ادفانسد الحقيقه تحت امرك هو في اسئله بسيطه كده عايز اسالها لحضرتك اي بارت من الكولون حضرتك بتستعمله في العمليات دي يعني هل بتعمل ايه اللي يخليك تختار الترانسفيرس او الاسيندنج او الديسيندنج السؤال الثاني حضرتك اتكلمت على انك يو ستوب سام تايمز الانتي دراجز اللي بتستعمل في الريجكشن او الدراجز اللي بتستعمل في الاوتو ترانسبلانت ايه الانديكيشنز انك انت تستوب الدراجز دي مش حضرتك قلت حاجه زي كده؟ اه يو مين الو ترانسبلانت اي مين الو الاوتو ترانسبلانت ده ما بتحتاجلوش اميون سبريشن الو ترانسبلانت رايت سو The vascular anatomy, you know, there is a wide variation, yeah, Dr. Gamal, for the vascular anatomy of the colon. So uh, you dissect uh, the three major vesicles, the ascending branch, if the, um, if the inferum is enteric, the mid-colic, the ileocolic, and uh, depends on how much length of the colon you need, and then you'd make trial and error with vascular clamp to see what is the major feeding vascular vesicle to the marginal artery. Um, and um, uh, that is the only way you can do it. Um, 
Uh, so trial and error clamping the, uh, the uh, ascending branch of the inferior enteric artery and clamping the ileocolic and see if the middle colic will provide you with the good blood supply to the segment you need. If it doesn't work, uh, vice versa, clamp the middle colic, use ascending lift colic, et cetera, et cetera. And also it's gonna depend on, and you're gonna use anti-colic, or, you know, uh, anti-prostaltic or isoprostaltic for the colon, particularly for the colon bypass. Everyone has advantage, disadvantage. The major problem uh, sometimes I face, and some of the skits already have failed colon bypass or gastric bypass. So their anatomy is totally distorted and you have to be just very careful and try to be creative. The, um, the jejunum, uh, if you're doing uh, interposition graft to replace the stomach, it's easy to use. Uh, colon, it's also easy to use. The jejunum to use as a uh, uh, attached vascular vehicle for the esophageal replacement is extremely difficult. It's impossible sometimes. Uh, the stomach, if there is residual stomach left in this uh, patient, particularly post-corrosive, and you can take it up, you can take it up. This also play a major role in your reconstructive surgery, how much the cervical esophagus is preserved um, uh, approximal to the corrosive part. Uh, for your uh, immunosuppression, really, that as I said in the slide, um, that um, achievement of allograft tolerance, as uh, say Roy Khan is still saying or used to say, is around the corner. And we haven't achieved much. We can achieve a few cases of uh, immunosuppression free state by trial and error. We don't have any litmus paper. There is some work on the T regulatory cells and others uh, uh, immune markers to help us um, um, uh, if some of this patient can come off TPN. Uh, the liver is a tolerogenic organ and you could do that in some patients, uh, but you carry the risk of chronic changes in the allograft. You don't see it until the patient have uh, failed the allograft. The intestine is not as tolerogenic as the liver or the least tolerogenic organ. So you have to be very careful with them. The patient that I mentioned to you, he did it on his own. I have three or four patients that they tried in their own and they surprised me that they are off immunosuppression. Um, uh, uh, and, the, and they did okay. So we, I'll be nervous to do it. But the patient, obviously, he was in a minimal immunosuppression and uh, he forgot to take the prograph maybe two or three times a week and he forgot to take it and he did good. So uh, after a year or so came to me, he said, I have a surprise for you. I'm not taking any prograph for the last year or two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, patient, we learn from the patient all the time. But to answer your question, that we do not have any biomarker tell us who can come off immune suppression, who cannot. The liver is very tolerogenic and over years, the more years goes by with no immunosuppression, with no rejection, the better a chance to reduce their immunosuppression. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, one of my good friends, uh, because of the COVID, I transplant to give him a liver transplant in uh, Pittsburgh in, uh, in the late nineties. And, um, he lied to me uh, when COVID came, uh, he stopped his immunosuppression totally. And then he started having some liver dysfunctions and um, unfortunately developed multiple myeloma. And then he called me, you know, confessing that he stopped his immunosuppression for three years. It's unfortunate that he died from uh, liver failure uh, despite um, uh, effective treatment for the multiple myeloma because with the stop of the immunosuppression for three years, reduced his hepatic reserve and make the liver uh, very vulnerable uh, to the multiple myeloma treatment. <laughs> اتفتحت وان شاء الله 500 500 يكون لك شير فيها ومشروع الانتستاينال انا كل 
انا كل حياتي لمصر ومعاونتكم ومساعدتكم وبترحيبكم ده اللي يسعدني ان انا اقدر اعمل حاجه لمصر ان شاء الله يشرفنا به الله يخليك اوكي دكتور وليد اكمل اوكي هلو دكتور كريم هاي دكتور وليد هاو ار يو I'm fine. Thanks a lot for your informative talk. Um, Where is your beautiful face? Can I see your face? I miss your face. <laughs> Or you're sleeping under the under the blanket? Yeah? <laughs> I'm listening. Oh, good. Excellent. Isaac uh, Habibi. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you give the patients with short bowel syndrome one to two years for an ad adaptive process. Okay, before intervening with uh, surgical treatment, either lengthening or transplantation. So I how did, do you manage? I did, I did not say that. I did not say that at all. <laughs> I never said that. Okay, I'm sorry if you misunderstood what I said. So there is a natural adaptation process. A natural okay. adaptation process goes slowly up to two years. The reason I'm saying that because you don't rush to transplant patients, give them a chance to fully adapt, particularly in the kids, to enhance the adaptation process and to speed up the adaptation process, you have to intervene by three variables. One, feed the patient as soon as possible because the food is the most introtrophic factor for the introcytes. Number two, Use biologic agents if available, enterocyte okay. growth factors. Three, reconstruct the gut as soon as you can with autologous reconstruction, with remodeling, with whatever it takes. Do not keep the intestine not utilized. So okay. I, I, I just to give you the slide in preparation for, uh, for the rest of the talk, Uh, and I'm sorry if I didn't make myself clear, and it could be my accent as well. No, no, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Other is you, uh, you, you encouraged us to avoid the side-to-side -side anastomosis. Right. You meant on all bowel only or on overall? Any organs, if you can do end-to-end, -end, that would be the best. The second best okay. was end-to-side. The last is side to side. But sometimes you're obligated to do end to side or side to side. When? The end to side, you do it when you have major discrepancy in the diameter of the bowel. So you may have some technical difficulty to, add to unless you have a lot of experience, and then you can end with the leak. So it's better to do it end to side than end to end if you carry high risk of leak. Side to side is the best for patient with, <laughs> with very narrow um, lumen and have vascular anomalies um, and vascular thrombosis or, uh, you know, when they lost the bowel due to vascular occlusion, arterial or venous, they usually don't have a good blood supply. And it's better to do side to side rather than intervening with the mesenteric vessels. Um, so you have to weigh the benefit and risk of each and the, the anatomy of the, of, the, of, the, of the gut, intestine or colon. Uh, for example, patient with gut dysmotility, and I learned it the hard way early on, they develop significant ballooning of the side-to-side -side anastomosis. So now I prohibit my team or myself from doing any side-to-side or end to side with the dysmotility patients, you always have to do it end to end. So it depends on your underlying disease. It depends on the vascularity. It depends on the diameter of the two connecting pieces. There is symmetry or similar diameter or there is discrepancy. So these three variables are extremely important for you to choose the right technique to reconstruct the gut. Okay, thanks a lot. Anytime. Dr. Mustafa Rafai. We're having a half, uh, we're having a, a um, fun tonight. 
Two more questions. We have two more questions. No, anytime. No, no, no. Anytime. I'm yours until uh, uh, midnight. Mustafa Rafai. Hi, Dr. Karim. Hi, Dr. Mustafa. محاضرة فعلا مفيدة جدا على الرغم ان انا دي تاني مرة احضرها مع حضرتك كنت بسأل حضرتك بس I don't say I don't say the same thing every time الهوست نوت قال لهم تحت بقول لحضرتك ان المال نيوتريشن افتر بارياتريك سيرجري you consider as gut failure right so if you look at the paper in 2015 I defined the type of gut failure for patient with gut with uh, bariatric surgery, either um, uh, surgical, uh, malabsorptive, or oral intolerance. So for some of the patient with, um, I'll go from the end, for the, from the last one, for some patient to have bariatric surgery, they already have underlying gut dysmotility. And you will notice uh, that patient with gut dysmotility, good number of them, they're morbidly obese, but only fat. There is no muscle mass. The lean body mass is very poor, but they follow fat. And this is because of the malabsorptive function of the, of the large bowel. So some of this patient, after you do ruin Y or a sleeve, they get worse and they develop oral intolerance. They lose the weight, but they keep losing the weight until they become severely malnourished. The second one is a malabsorptive, um, and that is what the rationale of the whole bariatric surgery. And if you do it too much, uh, like the uh, Sukunara, whatever the guy from uh, Spain or Mexico, uh, if you do too much- from Italy. Yeah, from Italy. If you do too much of the malabsorptive techniques, uh, that's why you get, you get developed the mini bypass, all the shit stuff. By the way, bariatric surgery will be obsolete uh, within the next few years. Um, I truly believe in that. Uh, it will be the least surgery uh, uh, advisable. And the biologic treatment is the way to go. And I said this in 2015 paper, and you can see it now. All the GLB-1 therapy now is, uh, uh, is like a, a fire all over the world. Um, it's like a virus is spreading very, very quickly. Uh, definitely may not be the treatment for everyone, but it's gonna put bariatric surgery onto rest. The uh, third one, uh, the surgical uh, tree, uh, surgical mishaps, uh, which is this connected gut, um, you know, all of the stuff that you're familiar with, uh, internal hernia, all that stuff, yes. uh, fistulas, um, uh, gastric or duodenal or intestinal, you know, you see it all. Actually, I have even patients I, I uh, needed to transplant them from South America that early on uh, with the bariatric surgery, they put the guy who put the true car invaded or damaged the spermocentric artery and vein and the patient lost to the gut and required transplant. Did I answer your question? Yes, Dr. Karim. Uh, I could announcement on fellowship from Mustafa Nes. Yes. How to apply it? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm just giving you what I have in mind. I have to uh, work with the uh, with the Magnus Al 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 Jamaat. I'm hoping to get some help with that. Uh, yeah, with, yeah, absolutely. We have a curriculum, and um, actually, I'm buying now a video camera for um, uh, what they call it broadcasting uh, that uh, not. You know, not everybody has to come to the operating room, but they can watch the surgery uh, in the um, in the conference room. Robin of
Yes, please go ahead. Thank you for uh, this uh, talk and advanced techniques in uh, gut uh, reconstruction. Uh, regarding uh, colon uh, interposition for uh, new stomach, uh, what about the incidence of uh, malignancy at uh, your experience and this huge number of uh, cases as I uh, saw? The incidence of malignancy in what? In where? What in the new stomach? And the stomatic side. No, the, I haven't seen a case uh, of uh, malignancy. I have seen cases uh, with gastric cancer, endodenal cancer after a multivisceral transplant when I preserved their stomach or their duodenum, but not for the autologous reconstruction. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that was the last question. I need to take you guys out for dinner. Can you come join me? I'm going to take you all for dinner. <laughs> I know. I tell you a story. Uh, my late mother, which I loved, uh, and we were in love uh, since my father died uh, when I was six. So she... Um, uh, she was visiting my sister in Saudi Arabia. And then uh, I used to have a video uh, with the beginning of the Zoom. This thing was about, what, uh, 10 years ago. And every time I talked to her, she asked my sister, she said, prepare the lunch for him. He needs to eat. So I got the same thing. So I'd love to uh, uh, keep... Uh, talking to you guys and glad to help in every way I can and I love you all we should definitely do another webinar later maybe in two months or something if absolutely. you have the time oh absolutely there is a lot of material tell me what you want see uh tell me uh, Dr. Hisham what do you guys want to hear and I'll be glad to uh, to accommodate your uh, your requirement Maybe perhaps the next uh, talk, technical tips, muscle uh, considering bowel surgery, whatever, whatever you, you can okay. tell us, we will we'll be glad to listen. Eh? Yeah, let me give it some thoughts and see if anything, um, I could uh, okay. talk about the Gatman rotation if you have a pediatric group or even adult group, I think that's something um, I'll be interested to teach. Um, uh, or to share with you um, our experience and the new procedure uh, will be uh, technical uh, tips also that something may be good. And I'm sure I think uh, very important also is um, I can get, um, well, I didn't have too much time, but I wanna uh, highlight the medical treatment for patient with gut failure, because that's something really we're lacking in Egypt. And it's, okay. the ideas will come. Uh, malignancy, transplant for malignancy, gut rehab for malignancy, I mean, gut, re gut surgery for uh, gut malignancy, uh, small bowel tumors, I can give you a talk, and that's maybe something good. Surgical management. Okay, we'll take it. Whatever you feel comfortable the giving us, we'll take it. Now, here what it, put this one, um, uh, intestinal malignancy, uh, surgical management of intestinal malignancy, or intestinal malignancy, uh, pathology okay. and surgical treatment, something like that. I think well, it be uh, we'll, co we'll coordinate through WhatsApp uh, regarding the date and uh, more details. Uh, go easy on me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Karim. Look, Are you recording time, all this stuff? Yes, I will send you tomorrow. By tomorrow, you'll have the video. What about the others? Did you send me the others? Because this is, would be very, uh, very uh, helpful for other people who could not attend in the middle of the night in Egypt. Yes, yes. I, by tomorrow, you'll have the link. Okay, thank you very much.
شكرا شكرا دكتور ماجن مرة جاي ان شاء الله لي عاشوا عندك يعني <تصفيق> نتعشى كلنا مع بعض ان شاء الله شكرا دكتور جمال شكرا 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 جزيلا تصبح على خير جود نايت ايفري ون تحت عام جود نايت